Dying to be stuck, Mocky. Chapter 20. Vera gets even more exercise. Now leave the bridge so we can close it, insisted the official in an agitated manner. And make haste. He nervously surveyed the moonlit surroundings, glancing several times down at the river. That's all right, we don't mind taking the risk, said Vera. We're in a hurry, so we'll just be on our way. She grabbed Mirren's elbow and steered him around, but she was stopped short by the official's barking voice. Halt! I have orders to guard this bridge all night and shoot anyone attempting to use it. The consequences of rousing Risenwick any further could be dire for this town. You and your stupid superstitions, muttered Vera, as she and Mirren turned around once more and trudged off the bridge. They walked a short distance with the appearance of heading into town, then darted behind a convenient bush at the side of the road. So what do we do now? asked Vera. Unless you relish the idea of a crossbow bolt between your shoulder blades, I recommend we wait, replied Mirren, peering back at the bridge where it was just possible to make out the two men tying a rope across the entrance. That was a surprising utterance about superstitions for someone recently dragged by the ankles from Risenwick's grasp. I was never in any danger, asserted Vera. Except perhaps for the danger of drowning, returned Mirren. Vera didn't have a response to this. Even though her memory of it seemed to belong to someone else, she could feel her head immersed in the river with complete confidence that she could breathe water. This certainly didn't seem to support her belief she'd been in no danger, so why was she still so sure that Risenwick presented no threat? You can wait here for who knows how long, but I'm going to try something, said Vera. Based on the expression on your face when you saw me swimming in the river, it could work. She scurried across the road and into the bushes on the far side, making her way towards the river bank where they had spent the day. It was rough going by moonlight, and a couple of times she stumbled badly, the second time knocking her forehead soundly on a thick tree branch. She had to lean against the tree for a minute to regain her senses, so she took things a little more carefully after that. Eventually she felt the ground sloping rapidly away from her and knew she'd found her way back to the river bank. She immediately turned towards the bridge she figured to be about 200 metres to her right, and staggered clumsily along the steep slope. Before she was halfway to the bridge, she put her right foot down awkwardly and badly twisted her ankle. She dropped to the ground to clutch at the hot, tearing sensation and clamped her jaw shut to keep the agony at bay. When the pain had abated somewhat, she continued slowly on her way by walking on her right knee on the higher side of the slope and bending her left knee a ridiculous amount to compensate. Luckily, she didn't have to do this for very long, as she soon tangled herself with a fallen tree branch that felt custom-made for a walking staff. She broke off a few inconvenient twigs, then used it to lurch along with a little more speed than before, even though every limping step caused her ankle to explode with pain. By the time Vera saw the side of the bridge looming ahead of her, the moon was in a completely different part of the sky from when she had left Mirren. Once she dragged herself under the structure, out of sight of anyone on the bridge, she found she could no longer hold in her distress and let herself wail with all the pain, frustration, fear and despair she had bottled up inside. Having started, she then found it difficult to stop. So much had happened in the last day and a half that didn't normally happen to a suburban 15-year-old on an average weekend that she was feeling emotionally overwhelmed. She quickly forgot the reason she'd set out on her quest to the bridge and just leaned back against the cold stone arch and wept her confusion and loneliness to the uncaring night. When her outburst had reduced to a sobbing that boomed strangely under the bridge, she heard a voice drifting down from above. Vera? Vera? She pulled herself together with a quick reprimand, cleared her tear-choked voice, and called back, Mirren, is that you? Where are you? On the bridge. Your plan succeeded. They heard your performance of a wailing rising wick, and they both hastened back to Trinknopf. Oh yeah, said Vera to herself with some amusement. That's why I dragged myself here, isn't it? She pulled herself along the ground until she could look up at the parapet above and see Mirren's outline against the sky. You'll have to come down and help me. I don't think I can walk any further, she called up to him. When she saw his silhouette hesitate, she added, The wailing was actually me, remember? Of course, he replied, with a certain lack of conviction. While Mirren found his way down the side of the bridge, Vera lay on her back and stared up at the sky. She wished she'd taken more of an interest in stargazing, as it would be reassuring to know if this were a similar view as the one from her own backyard. 
At that moment, she saw the edge of an enormous moon rising over the outline of the bridge, flooding her surroundings with a cool glow. When she twisted her head up and over to her right, she could see the other, smaller moon that had lit her route to the river. Well, I guess that answers my question. Mirren clambered his way down the last of the steep bank and sat down next to Vera. Are you injured? he asked with concern. Not at all. I just like to lie back now and then and take in the universe, while my ankle throbs painfully. I think I'll manage to walk, though, if you can act as my crutch. Mirren helped her to stand and took her right arm across his broad shoulders. She hardly had to do any work in climbing up the bank, as he almost carried her. When they reached the road, Mirren surprised her by scooping her into his arms and lifting her over the rope tied across the entrance to the bridge. He didn't bother putting her down again on the other side, but continued carrying her like a new bride. Vera wished that stupid big moon wasn't shining right at her. She felt her telltale face glowing like a third moon and wondered how visible her embarrassment was to Mirren. Ah, here is our stuck mocky, he said. Vera turned to see for Herjon, bounding out from behind a bush near the far end of the bridge, and felt compelled to wriggle out of Mirren's arms into a standing position. Herjon hurried towards them as soon as Vera began hopping her way along. Vera, what has happened to you? it asked in a worried voice. Then it caught sight of the large lump on her forehead from her encounter with the tree. It turned an accusatory stare on Mirren, who bristled and said, All her own achievement, I assure you. Don't worry for Herjon, Vera hurried to intervene. I'm sure it's all nothing you can't easily fix. The main thing is we're across the river now and we can go back to getting you home. Yes, that's true, beamed Verherjean. Then its smile faded. Oh. What's the matter? asked Vera. Well, I just checked with my heart and it seems my clan moved tonight. Stuck Mocky a nomadic? asked Vera. Yes, and now they're over there, it said, pointing back across the bridge behind them.